Hi guys, John Bailey here, gemstone artist and founder of the Faceting Academy. Welcome back to another quick project video. This is going to be about this uh, pretty little piece of pink tourmaline sent to us by a client. And we'll follow this stone from the initial rough evaluation that we're going to do now all the way through to the finished piece. This is a uh, small piece of pink tourmaline. Fingers for scale. <laughs> So uh, initially, the very first thing we always do is uh, white paper test to see uh, what's our color quality here. And we got a nice pink color. Uh, the camera doesn't quite pick up a little bit of a purplish uh, tone to this thing. But uh, we got some transparency and we've got a uh, little bit of color to work with. So right away we know we're going to try to capture as much color as we can. Let's move on to the physical integrity and see what, uh, what that appears to show us. Right away we can see over on this right hand end that there's a fracture and an included area and we're going to want to remove that for sure. So certainly uh, some of the initial work that we're going to want to do is to saw this saw this right hand end off of the stone right along this line. That'll be pretty straightforward. And looking over towards the left hand end, we start to see a similar kind of a feature, a little veil. Certainly the, the left most of these two, this little guy right here. And when we angle the stone to catch the light reflecting off of our white paper in the background, as we've picked this stone up, our light is bouncing off the white paper and up through the stone. So we're backlighting that veil. You can see when I interrupt the light with my pen. We're backlighting this veil right here, and that's what causes it to cast a shadow and appear dark from this particular angle. We tip it both directions and we get right on the veil. You can see it's really dark and we can get an idea that it's it's all the way through the stone. So that kind of a feature not only is it optically potentially a real problem because it's going to cut across our pavilion facets and, and be reflected in a really dense manner, uh, it's structurally an issue. So it's going to come off. The next question is, what about the next one? What about this feature right here? Is it also a structural issue as well as an optical issue? Because it's a significant portion, significant percentage. Even if we cut this off, this distance is a significant percentage of this total distance. You know, that's, uh, what is that, nearly 20% of our length just as a guesstimate, that's going to cost us some size and some weight. Do we keep it or do we lose it? And that'll be part of what we're sorting out as we move along here. So in the initial just uh, in the air, no immersion yet, initial look, we know we've got to take this, we know we've got to take this, so at most, there's our length. Maybe that's got to come off. It's not looking, it's not looking great at the moment. What else can we see here as we start to roll this thing around and reflect the light? I saw something lighting up a minute ago. That right there. That bright reflection. So that's the opposite of what's going on with these veils over here. Instead of light reflecting off the white paper and casting a shadow, like this veil, the light is reflecting directly off this feature and lighting up. It's, it's coming from outside the frame, hitting this feature right to our eye and lighting it up. So what is that? Where is that? How deep is that? Is it a structural problem? Here's our lovely pink Himalaya tourmaline in immersion, just in water. And this time we're lighting the stone from an angle rather than from behind. 
We've marked the flaws with a Sharpie pen for trimming, and we're going to use a variable speed trim saw set to a lower speed to reduce shock on the stone. We're using a narrow kerf blade to make the slice. You might notice the blade doesn't run perfectly true, so we use a fingertip to steady the blade as we align the stone and make the cut slowly. We penetrate only when we're happy with the stone's alignment. As the saw cut proceeds, the remaining material grows thin and risk of fracture becomes a concern. We mitigate this risk by flipping the stone and cutting from the other side. Polariscope examination can reveal flaws or inclusions we may have missed during other studies, and even internal strain that might be concerning. Next, we'll preform the gem to prepare for dopping. Precise preforming is critical to yield. Here, we're propping the rough in a V-dop to organize our initial shaping. We've removed the wing containing the structural flaw we found during evaluation. We've shaped the pavilion area and placed the temp table so the rough will very closely match the pavilion portion of our diagram. We can raise the crown angles to capture more weight once we reach that stage of cutting. For right now, we're focused on the position of the keel and the girdles. This looks good. Time to dop. Here's our tourmaline, precisely dopped and ready for cutting. This video is in part testing the Hyper Edge 500 Ed Perry Hyper Edge 500 lap. So we're going to position this tourmaline to calibrate the length first. Make sure we're in our lap nice and wet. really cuts amazingly fast and leaves an amazingly smooth finish for the speed that it cuts at. I can feel it grab and I can hear the motor. I give it just a little pressure to make it bite. You can really hear it. You can really feel it. really cutting very fast and very smooth. I've got a little bit of dop wax exposed, so we'll see how it behaves cutting dop wax, which can be a real pain for some laps. They'll gum up really bad. At the moment, I don't feel this one doing that at all. One of the things that I always do on a pencil type cut
Here's our pavilion, cutting completed on the HyperEdge 500 lab. And we're going to go directly to polish from here. You might notice we did not cut steps on the ends. This decision is based on a variety of factors that influence the value of the gem net of labor. Those factors include that labor to cut and polish the faces, as well as the loss of weight, but are primarily based on visual presentation, including in this stone, presentation of the tube inclusions, the effects of which would be disrupted by chopping out part of the pavilion and the disruptive light patterns those facets would create. We covered detailed protocols for whether to chop pavilion ends or to install other features in a course called Value by Design, Strategies for Maximizing Value Through Selection and Placement of Design Elements. You can learn more about that course on facetingacademy.com. We're polishing one of the long pavilion facets on a diametrix lap from Gearloose and using our own Blackmagic Voodoo Polish in half micron particle size. I'm spinning this lap pretty fast for a synthetic ceramic lap and using moderate pressure so you see my finger is directly on the stone to monitor for heat buildup. This is the number of strokes necessary to go from the 500 Hyper Edge lap to a fully quality checked final polish on this facet. Here's our completed pavilion, transferred and with the transfer bond tested. Always test your bond before releasing the first stop. If you look carefully, you can see the tube inclusions inside the stone. Here's the release procedure. Many people make this more complicated than it needs to be. Make sure you release the correct dop. I hold the stone between two fingers and the dop I'm removing between two fingers. I apply constant, gentle, but firm twisting force to the dop as I heat it. This causes it to separate quickly as soon as the wax softens even slightly. Here we're cutting the crown facets on one of Daniel Hughes' Dreamer 800 laps. These are quite quick and leave a pretty smooth finish. On all the crown facets other than the table, we went directly from this lap to our half micron voodoo black magic polish on a gear loose diamatrix lap. Now we're polishing the table facet. Notice I'm keeping my thumb in contact with the stone itself to monitor for heat buildup that could cause the stone to shift on the dop or even damage a heat shock sensitive stone. With the table polish, we can see the little internal flaw that we've been tracking since the first step of rough evaluation. At this angle and with frosted facets, it looks pretty obvious. We can also see the tube inclusions really well. They aren't as numerous as they will appear when reflected repeatedly in the house of mirrors that the pavilion makes for the finished stone. Here's our finished Himalaya tourmaline with the tube inclusions creating a really cool, almost cat's eye effect. Here's the internal flaw we've been tracking from the very beginning. Let's go back and see what it looked like during rough evaluation. The light is reflecting directly off this feature and lighting up. It's, it's coming from outside the frame, hitting this feature right to our eye and lighting it up. Flat, highly reflective, uh, kind of a flaw just below our tweezer points 
It's the brightest, most obvious thing flashing right now. And that is semi-flat. As we rotate the stone, we can see it go flat here. So this is edge on. We can get a pretty good idea the extent of that. Where does it travel? How long is it? And when we do this, we get an idea of how wide is it. And it's probably not going to cause the stone to fall apart or create a structural integrity problem going forward. So it's probably going to live in the finished stone. The flaw is quite visible looking at the stone sideways. But as the stone rotates into face-up position, it all but disappears. An explanation of how we achieve this lapidary ledger domain is in the full version of this video, available to members at facetingacademy.com.